Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bi bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of people say it's China. racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It's a disease, without question, has more names than any disease in history. I can name Kung Flu. I can name 19 different versions of names. And my question is, have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And, and what gives you a high degree of confidence that this originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology? I can't tell you that. I'm not allowed to tell you that. Are you insinuating they intentionally let it spread? Well, to they could population? have done it. And, and I'm just saying, well, one of two things happened. They, they either didn't do it and, you know, they couldn't do it from a competent standpoint or they let it spread. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has said there is a significant amount of evidence the virus came from a Wuhan laboratory. This pandemic came out of China, and it came out of China for a reason. That's a country with poor health practices. It's a country where government officials deliberately covered up the early stages of the virus when it could have been stopped before it spread out of control. In fact, the outbreak may have begun not in a public meat market, but in a poorly run Chinese laboratory. Now, that's not our theory. Anyone who raises that theory on American television is attacked as a conspiracy monger. The Communist Party of China is trying to blame the virus on America. We have waged a fierce battle against the invisible enemy, the China virus. We must hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague onto the world, China. Boy, oh boy, do you have a great immune system. Take on directly the challenges posed by our most serious competitor, China will confront China's economic abuses, counter its aggressive, coercive action to push back on China's attack on human rights, intellectual property, and global governance. We're going to stop the Chinese from their actions. We should be gone to the UN immediately and sought sanctions against them in the United Nations for what they did. We have to be firm. We don't have to go to war, but we have to make it clear, this is as far as you go, China. We are Pacific power, and we are not going to back away. Today is Thursday, March 25th. The year is 2021. This is No Easy Answers, and I am your host, Jules Taylor. Today, like all days, I have no easy answers for you. Well, thank you for tuning in from wherever you happen to be listening. My name is Jules Taylor. This is No Easy Answers, and I am delighted to have you with us for today's episode. Before we get started, I just want to send a quick shout out to our latest patron, Colin. Thank you so much. You are now a postmodernist, and we are sending a big thank you for the support, and we truly could not do this without you. So thanks, Colin. If you would like to support this podcast, the single best way you can do so is by becoming a paid monthly subscriber on our Patreon page. That helps us keep the wheels in motion for all the reading, research, writing, and producing that goes along with each episode. Short of a monetary donation, it really helps the show if you can leave us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts. Of course, sharing the show on your social media or recommending the show to your friends and family, those are the highest forms of compliments we receive. So thank you to everyone who makes this show possible, all of our loyal listeners, and of course, all of our Patreon subscribers. I also want to send a thank you to our interview guest, Dr. Asatar Bear, for speaking with us. He's a professor of economics and statistics at Riverside City College, and I've left some links in the show notes for his social media, so be sure to give him a follow on Twitter and check out his book, Prison Labor in the United States and Economic Analysis. Dr. Bear also teaches meditation, and he has a lot of videos on his YouTube channel, so I think some listeners who are interested in meditation will especially enjoy those. Okay, so I've prefaced our conversation with a monologue. Let's get to that, and then our interview with Dr. Bear.
On March 16, 2021, a 21-year-old white male was taken into custody after a series of shootings occurred at three massage parlors in Atlanta, Georgia. The shooter killed eight people and wounded one. Six died at the scene, one en route to the hospital, and one in treatment. Their ages range from 33 to 74 years of age, with six of those victims being women of Asian descent. According to the police, the shooter was motivated by a sexual addiction that was at odds with his religious beliefs. The New York Times reported that he, quote, seemed to have a fixation on sexual temptation, one that can lead to despair among people who believe they are failing to follow the ideal of refraining from sex and even lust outside heterosexual marriage. Although the purported motives of the shooter center on a sexual addiction, the event, which took the lives of six Asian women, marks a new and horrible chapter in the shameful history of Asian women being reduced to sex objects and the marginalization of Asian peoples within American society. As early as the 1870s, white Americans were already making this association, this assumption of Asian women being walking sex objects. The Page Act of 1875 prohibited women coming to the United States from anywhere for, quote, immoral purposes, but the law was largely enforced against Chinese women. U.S. military deployments in Asia have played a role in the fueling of sex trafficking there, starting after the Spanish-American War, when traffickers and brothel owners in the Philippines bought and sold women and girls to meet the demands of U.S. soldiers. During the Vietnam War, Women from Thailand and many other Asian countries were used for sex by U.S. soldiers at various rest and recreation spots. The bodies and perceived submissiveness of Asian women were eroticized and hypersexualized, and eventually these racist stereotypes were brought back to the U.S. Professor Catherine Senesa Choi, a University of California Berkeley professor of ethnic studies and a Filipino-American, says, quote, in American society, Asian Americans are not seen and listened to. We are seen in specific ways at times, as model minorities, as projections of white male fantasy. But we are not seen as full-fledged Americans. We are not seen as full human beings. It's a kind of erasure and dehumanization. New data has revealed over the past year the number of anti-Asian hate incidents, which include shunning, slurs, and physical attacks, is greater than previously reported and a disproportionate number of attacks have been directed at women. Nearly 3,800 incidents were reported over the course of roughly a year during the pandemic. It's a significantly higher number than last year's count of about 2,600 hate incidents nationwide over the span of five months. Now clearly there is a link between the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and the anti-China rhetoric coming from our media and elected officials. From casting accusations of developing the COVID-19 virus in a laboratory, the media's depiction of Chinese wet markets, to the former president's usage of the term China virus. All of this is fueled and added to the amplification of anti-Asian sentiment along with the racial misogyny of women of Asian descent. GOP representative from Texas, Chip Roy, opened a Thursday hearing dedicated to the rise of violence against Asian Americans with a reference to lynching. We believe in justice. Right? There's old sayings in Texas about, you know, find the, all the rope in Texas and get a tall oak tree. Uh, you know, we take justice very seriously, and, and we ought to do that. Uh, round up the bad guys. That's what we believe. Whether talking about China the Chai Coms, the Chinese Communist Party, whatever phrasing we want to use. And if some people are saying, hey, we think those guys are the bad guys for whatever reason. And let me just say clearly, I do. I think the Chinese Communist Party running the country of China, I think they're the bad guys. And I think that they are harming people. And I think they are engaging in modern day slavery. And I think that what they're doing to the Uyghurs, and I think that what they're doing targeting our country, and I think that what they're doing to undermine our national security, and what they're doing to steal our intellectual property, and what they're doing to build up their military and rattle uh, throughout uh, the Pacific, I think it's patently evil and deserving of condemnation. And I think that what they did to hide the reality of this virus is equally deserving of condemnation. This came two days after six women of Asian descent lost their lives in Atlanta, with Representative Ted Lieu of California taking to Twitter to say, quote, the largest mass lynching in U.S. history was against Chinese immigrants. 
Along with the rhetoric surrounding the pandemic, another aspect of anti-China rhetoric has emerged, with the U.S. and its allies casting accusations of genocide and human rights abuses against the Chinese government. According to International Convention, genocide is the, quote, intent to destroy, whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. This is following reports that, as well as interning Uyghurs in camps, China has been forcibly mass sterilizing Uyghur women to suppress the population and separating Uyghur children from their families. On his final day in office under the Trump administration, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said, quote, I believe this genocide is ongoing and that we are witnessing the systematic attempt to destroy Uyghurs by the Chinese party state. As of Monday, March 22nd, Politico is reporting that the United States and its allies in Canada, Britain, and the European Union have announced sanctions on several Chinese officials alleged to have what U.S. officials say is a genocidal campaign against Uyghur Muslims. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said in a statement, quote, The United States reiterates its calls on the PRC to bring an end to the repression of Uyghurs, who are predominantly Muslim, and members of other ethnic and religious minority groups in Xinjiang, including the releasing of those arbitrarily held in internment camps and detention facilities. These actions demonstrate our ongoing commitment to working multilaterally to advance respect for human rights and shining a light on those in the PRC government and Chinese Communist Party responsible for these atrocities, end quote. Now, China has said the reports it has detained Uyghurs are completely untrue. It insists that Uyghur militants are waging a violent campaign for an independent state by plotting bombings, sabotage, and civic unrest. But it is also accused of exaggerating the threat in order to justify the repression of Uyghurs. China says all of this is necessary to prevent terrorism and root out Islamist extremism, and the camps are an effective tool for re-educating inmates in its fight against terrorism. China has dismissed claims it is trying to reduce the Uyghur population through mass sterilizations as baseless, and says allegations of forced labor are completely fabricated. Here to talk to me about all of this is Dr. Asatar Baer. Dr. Baer, thanks for coming to the show. Welcome to No Easy Answers. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to speak to you. And I am a fan of your threads on Twitter. Um, the way that you've spoken about socialism in very simplistic, common sense terms. Uh, I had hoped to get you on the show uh, to speak about socialism or radical politics. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a um, you know an event that happened in Atlanta recently. So wait, maybe we could just have started by having you introduce yourself uh, and tell us a little bit more about what you do. Sure. Um, my name is Dr. Asatar Baer. Uh, I'm a professor of economics and I uh, also teach meditation. Uh, and I have been studying uh, the economics of uh, prisons. I wrote my dissertation and a book about the economics of the prison system, about prison labor in the United States. Uh, and, you know, I've studied socialism and communism and capitalism for a long time uh, as, you know, a student of, of Marxism uh, and have more recently, like in the last six months or so, gotten more active on Twitter. I had an account for a long time, but I just have, for whatever reason, become more active and discovered that there's a very thriving uh, left community on Twitter, which I did not know about at all. So it was very exciting to for me to encounter that and just see, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in these topics, you know, among a certain segment of, sure. of left Twitter. And, and that's been fantastic to connect with. Wonderful. All right. So um, you had a thread recently about uh, six, six different problems with the Uyghur genocide narrative. And I'm really eager to ask you about that. Um, but I thought first, because of this recent event, I, I think there is... Uh, I think there is some thought that perhaps anti-Asian sentiment is a relatively new thing with the rise of the coronavirus. And uh, obviously that's that's false. And there's a long history of anti-Asian sentiment in the United States. Uh, would you be comfortable speaking to a little bit of that history just to sort of set the table for where our conversation is going? Sure. Um, I guess we could sort of start with, I think that, you know, as as a Marxist or, you know, someone who's interested in applying uh, materialist dialectic analysis, we have to say, look, there's a connection between 
uh, the geopolitics of a situation, the the class politics at play, and individual acts of hate and violence. And, you know, like liberals kind of always want to separate these things and say, oh, yes, yeah, some people are insane or some people are hateful or whatever. And yes, of course, that's true, right? But, you know, and yeah, yeah. everything has, you know, these factors which which lead to them. And there's no question that when uh, the government says this is our enemy, um, that plays a role in terms of, well, what kind of people are targeted and victimized. And, you know, we saw this very, very clearly during the long and, you know, you could still say ongoing war on terror slash war on Islam, which you know, oh, we we don't we don't we mean to do a war on Islam. That's not our purpose at all. But of course, I mean, the results of it are that you know, absolutely. Um, so now it's China that's the great enemy, and um, you know, we have to recognize that there's a long history of wanting to subjugate China. This is not a new thing at all. I mean, this goes back to uh, the opium wars of of the 19th century, and uh, <clears throat> China was unable to resist. Uh, those those attempts to uh, you know there was China was never formally conquered because it's a very sprawling country which would be very very difficult to hold but you know the parts that the Western powers wanted right <laughs> you know they, right, right. they controlled and you know so and China you know lost face and was humiliated and you know this is the kind of discourse in the literature um, for a long time and you know they. Um, the Western powers took advantage of the chaos and the weakness of the emperor and so forth, and then the the warlord period. So, and you know, also just the use of um, you know migrant labor, right? Asian migrant labor. Um, so there's a long, long history here of of uh, you know anti Asian uh, racism. I mean, it's part of white supremacy, broadly speaking. Sure. Um, it has like a slightly different maybe discourse than, you know, anti-black racism, let's say, but, you know, it's all part of the same, you know, cloth, right, of, of white supremacy. And I think it's good to just recognize there's a very long history of that. Uh, and, it, it, you know, of course, it flares up when it's given official support. Maybe it was around the time when the coronavirus first kind of popped up in the United States. And it was probably then when I started noticing the amplification of this narrative of a Uyghur genocide happening. And, yeah. and you know, I, I feel like, in a way, Americans tend to sort of therapeutically yell or cast accusations at other countries. And, and they're strikingly similar accusations to what we're seeing at home. Like this Uyghur genocide, it kind of happened alongside the kids in cages stuff happening in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and you see this uh, this traveling with the coronavirus anti Asian sentiment that erupted there. Um, I, I thought it was kind of processual because it was like, so you have this coronavirus happening, and you have the epithets that were said by the Trump administration about that, and you had the the narrative of the Uyghur genocide, but you also had this sort of uh, seeming like sort of mechanism of dehumanization when we took a look at the at the wet markets and people asking things like what are they eating bats or so um so i think all of this like as a system works together um to fuel these uh, sort of like a new cold war like the the positing of a new great enemy i think so too yeah absolutely i mean that is clearly the what is underway here um, you're quite right to notice that the this Uyghur genocide narrative uh, is very, very new. I mean, this this started to happen in 2017, 2018, and then we started seeing more escalation 2019, 2020. Uh, but, you know, nobody was saying that basically before about 2017. You know, maybe there was a couple of precursors and saying, oh, you know, well, because, you know, China didn't didn't have a shift in they had a shift in policy around this in 2016 and they became a lot more assertive on the issue of terrorism i mean there's there's about 2000 terrorist attacks in in xinjiang between 1995 and 2016 2000 wow. i mean that's a lot right and some yeah. of these are absolutely horrifying 
you know, uh, people with knives killing dozens of people, right? I mean, can you imagine, right, what would happen in the United States? We don't even have to imagine, right? Like, we can right. look at something like the Boston Marathon bombing, which, right. you know, it only killed four people, but this dominated the news cycle. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people were injured as well, right? So, because terrorism isn't really about a death toll, right? It's it's about what kind of mark does it does it make on the kind of national psyche? You know, it's sure. it is designed to terrify, you know, and it does that because you know it's it's horrible to think that you're just a you know you're not a combatant, you don't have no you know you have no stake in any politics, and all of a sudden you're targeted, you know, for for reasons that are mysterious, and I mean that's absolutely horrifying. And so, you know, the China's response to that was to say. Well, we need to really get serious about Islamic radicalism in the region. And what we have here is we have this uh, <clears throat> this small uh, and pretty unpopular separatist movement, which uh, is the the uh, you know call, they they call for East Turkestan, right? That's that's what they're looking for. Um, East Turkestan is a completely fictional kind of concept. You know, it's it's based on a very selective reading of that history. Um, you know, this is Central Asia, right? It's a crossroads of a lot of different cultures. It's a place where, you know, there has been travel through this region for a long time, you know, like China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it harks back to the Silk Road of, you know, the Middle Ages and so on, right? So yeah. there's been a lot of traffic through this area for a long time and a lot of mingling of different cultures. And to act like that there's there was some kind of pure ethno state, I mean that never was true, right? right and so right. the these these separatists are, you know, I mean, these are these are groups that train with uh, Al Qaeda, you know, that that go to Afghanistan and you know learn how to make IUD. You know, I mean it's it's uh you know, East the East Turkestan uh independence movement was was uh placed on a terrorist watch list by the United States. So you know, it's uh, the use of terror as a tool of political to, to to attain political aims. I mean, that's um, a very old tactic too, right? But it's right. It's it's one that is, you know, uh, China took started to take it very seriously in 2016, and what they noticed was um, these groups were were promulgating a certain version, a very fundamentalist version of Islam that wasn't actually all that native uh, uh, to the Uyghur culture. Um, hmm. And so that's interesting, right? And so now what we're seeing is, so China said, look, if people are getting into radical separatist politics, we want to know about that early on. You know, yeah. we want to know about that. We want to know, like, are people changing the way that they're dressed? That Are they changing... The way that they, you know, present themselves, right? Because there's certain markers which are associated with this, you know, fundamentals kind of Islam. I mean, just just as in the United States, there's certain markers which associate somebody with radical fundamentalist Christianity, right? And right, you know, like if we were to take that seriously in the United States as, you know, a threat of violence, like imagine if fundamentalist Christians were committing thousands of terrorist attacks, right? I mean, they would absolutely be monitored by the government there's no question about that right right um i mean you know muslims were on watch lists and no fly lists and whatever even though there was no evidence that american muslims were involved in terrorism right so you know i mean it's it's just one of the things about this narrative is you see so much of this the pot calling the kettle black stuff right like where, yeah yeah you know like the united states oh we're so concerned about the fate of Muslims, like really? Well, why? Why then did you kill tens of millions of Muslims during the war on terror? You know? <laughs> yeah, there, it, God, you know, and I'm happy you point that out because that was something that I had. I mean, so many liberals in my life had been pointing to this, yelling about it, and and I'm like, where is this concern coming from? Where is our national concern uh, flipping the script from? You know, it's 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 hypocritical, and it's. Um, Whenever you see the, the the script flip like that, there's often some nefarious underpinnings and motivations behind that sort of thing. So it is absolutely it's, it's good to question that narrative. Um, and so I, I want to say also that, like, it's one thing to question narratives, but I think that, you know, any one of us who are pointing out these inconsistencies with the Uyghur genocide uh, narrative, um, you know, we, we run a real danger of being called genocide deniers. 
Um, and so it, it was, you know, I, I understand that, you know, my show is called No Easy Answers. So I'm deliberately trying to tackle things that are complex and nuanced. And, uh, and, and but I, I think there's a real danger here in offending some folks. Um, and so I, so I want to tread lightly around it because uh, I, I'm, I'm not in the business of minimizing the suffering of, 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 you know, people. I, I'm not in the business of, of casting accusations against countries that, that are calling the, 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 you know, the pot calling the kettle black, as you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we can get into some of the, the aspects of the narrative that are causing us to question this sort of thing. And you had a really great post about this the other day. And one thing that you po that you pointed out, um, which just absolutely floored me, um, was that no genocide in history has ever occurred amidst rising population, uh, rising life expectancy. There's official funding for the culture, for the religion, and for the language of these victims. So right. maybe you could speak to some of that. Yeah, so, you know, the genocide, first of all, is a very serious allegation. I mean, I can't yeah. think of a more serious allegation against a country. Uh, and you know, it's something that has, it's part of the, the UN Convention on Human Rights. It's been, it was ratified in 1946. And this is good, right? I mean, there should be international agreements which say, look, you know, like, just because you can get away with something doesn't mean you should, right? I mean, that's very, very important. And I think this is part of the, the march toward greater and greater civilization. I mean, for thousands of years, we've basically said, look, might makes right, you know? And now we're saying, no, uh, there's certain things that just aren't permissible. And so it's good that we have a, a genocide, uh, you know, convention, that we have an understanding of this. But it's also, we should not allow it to be weaponized and turned into this propaganda campaign. So when I'm looking at it, you know, I come from the from a background of uh, economics and statistics. Um, you know, I'm not a longtime expert in China by any means. Uh, I'm, you know, relatively new to the study of China. I don't speak the language. I haven't visited the country. What I do is I look at the data, you know, and I'm like, the data is just not consistent with the story, right? So, you know, there's there's somewhere between 11 and a half and, and 12 and a half million Uyghurs in Xinjiang, China. Um, and we're being told that a million of them or between one to three million of them are in concentration camps. Right. This is utterly preposterous because you cannot you, you cannot lock up a huge proportion of the adult population. Uh, you know, the the entire po the population in Xinjiang, which is between the prime working age population. So that's the age 15 to age 64 is only 13 million. So wow. are, are you telling me that you will you're locking up, you know, like a substantial proportion of the prime working age population? And that that's not going to have an impact on the economic growth of the region. I mean, that is, that's just astoundingly absurd, you know, like, right, there's right. no way you can do that, right? I mean, and, you know, history, when, when there's political tumult and repression and genocide, you're going to see that, right? You're going to see that in falling life expectancy. You're going to see that in a massive refugee crisis. You're going to see that in an in interruption of the economy. You're not going to see 8% growth in per capita GDP, which is what they see in Xinjiang. These things are just utterly inconsistent with that idea. And so that's that's why, where I started. I'm just like, look, the data don't reflect this. Now people come back and say, oh, well, you're going to trust the you know Chinese data they're manipulating and whatever. I'm like, I use the same data that the the critics who who want to you know throw around these accusations use. If it's good enough for them, then it's good enough for anyone, right? Like, sure, you can't have it both ways, right? Either the data is good or it's not good. I mean, right. So, you know, there there is a logic problem with this. A lot of people have pointed out that there's credibility problems as well. That the allegations come from a few people who have deep ties to State Department funding or to these radical separatist groups, where you can see there's a very strong political or financial motivation. Uh, and that's true. And I think that's worth pointing out. But I just started with the logic part because that, to me, that makes a little more sense, right? Like, because somebody could still be right, even though they're financially motivated or incentivized to produce a certain argument. 
that doesn't by itself mean they're wrong, right? Sure. So I started with a logic because I'm like, explain to me how these things can go together because I don't see it, right? <laughs> right, right. And I, 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 you know, thank you for telling me about, you know, I understand you, you're a professor of economics and you, you come from a world of data and, and statistics and spreadsheets. And so to, to take a hard look at data, stuff that you're very familiar with, uh, to be inconsistent with that narrative uh, certainly points something out that we can question. Uh, the credibility problem that you're talking about, you know, I, I had I have reviewed a few YouTube uh, videos before uh, before coming to this conference call. And so I, you know, I saw that there were actually like Chinese citizens who were talking about like, hey, there wasn't uh, a forced sterilization. That's not true. And um, right. yeah, so I, so I wonder the credibility problem uh, these first-hand reports have such an emotional impact, but are often false. So the stories have been significantly changed. Um, I think there's a tendency uh, for listeners, you know, there, there might be a, a tendency for them to think like, oh, well, you know, the Chinese government is oppressive or they're authoritarian or something. And and so, of course, they would change their stories uh, being uh, a citizen of such an oppressive regime or something. Um, maybe could you speak to you had mentioned that there are there is data and there are laws and policies that suggest that China is deeply committed towards the well-being of their citizens and a multi-ethnic nation. Yeah, in in a lot of ways, China is a model when it comes to to that. You know that that protections of of minorities in China are uh, enshrined in the constitution. That they are. Uh, they have a very comprehensive affirmative action type of policies. The uh, minorities are not subject to, you know, population control measures in the same way. Uh, I wrote a, another detailed thread on this as well. Um, just looking at uh, this, I mean, this is another area where China has been criticized for a long time for uh, having the most vigorous population control measures of probably any modern country. Uh, and then, you know, people said, oh, my God, you know, infanticide and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, it's part of an extremely overblown, really hysterical kind of look at this, right? Like China's never killed any babies, right? I mean, but they yeah. did fine people for having three children, right? So, sure. and, you know, one of their big issues was they, they, they're trying to move toward equality but they don't have that, right? And so some people are much more able to pay these fines than others, you know? Right. And there's stories of wealthy people throwing down the money and being like, we're going to have kids, boom, wow. you know, here's the wow. fine, yeah. right? Yeah. And and they're trying to have a law that applies to everyone and fines are notorious for not applying well, right? They basically are, you know, much more of a deterrent toward the poor. Um, so, I, you know, I think... I feel like I'm getting a little bit of field from the from the initial question that, that we were asked here, but you know, China does a lot to support and fund its its ethnic minorities, uh, including supporting the language, including supporting, you know, they build thousands of mosques in Xinjiang, and so and we're told, oh my, there's a there's some kind of wholesale effort to suppress the religion because they they put you know, oh, if you have this or this style of dress or whatever you're going on a watch list. Why? Because they want to suppress Islam? No, because they know, you know, look, there's a fundamentalist version of Islam, which is a very interest in political violence and separatism that we do want to suppress, but do we want to suppress Islam as a whole? No. Right. Uh, so I, I think it's very, like, it's very easy for us in the West to be like, yes, of course you want to step on Islam, right? Because yeah. The United States has a long history, and so does the West, broadly speaking, right? I mean, ever since the Crusades, there's a long history here of hating and fearing the Islamic world. So yeah. it's very easy for us to believe that the Chinese feel, of course, that they feel the same, you know? like, And there just is no evidence of that, and there's a huge amount of evidence to the contrary. I, I, one thing that I've found is that, I mean, obviously, Chinese citizens are, or the citizens of China are overwhelmingly in support of the Chinese Communist Party. And so I see a lot of pointing towards, like, even the day after the things that happened in Atlanta, there was a representative from Texas uh, just straight out saying that the Chinese Communist Party are the bad guys. 
Um, so we see this sort of saber rattling and uh, uh, this uh, divisive and amplifying this amplification of of anti Chinese sentiment coming from our representatives in in posturing them as the big enemy. Um, even right. the day after such a tragedy, you know, um, and so there is this notion that that because the Chinese government is not analogous to the United States's uh, brand of democracy, that that surely they can't have the type of freedoms that we do, or surely they can't be committed towards the well-being of their citizens. And but again, it's it's really the pot calling the kettle black because we've seen in the United States how we are basically allergic to helping out our own people you know we are uh we we give off this the semblance of democracy that that when we invite people to participate in electoral politics but we you know we, there's not there's certainly by no means a perfection of democracy within the american project and so uh just as we cast aspersions to uh, China, I think we we cast dispersions to any country that does not have a similarly set up form of democracy, as imperfect as it is here. Um, so there is this this notion of 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 thinking that China is a totalitarian place, that it is entirely restrictive, that it has all sorts of censorship. Um, and I I want to say that I mean, in in some of the interviews that I've listened to of other folks talking about this subject. Uh, one thing that they they kind of arrive on is that they're like, oh, I have no doubt there are some human rights abuses going on. But as to a genocide in the full power and weight of that word, that is most certainly not happening. Uh, would you would you agree with that, that there are some, uh, uh, you know, human rights abuses going on, but that genocide is just too strong of a word to use? <laughs> I think that this is this is too much adopting the terrain of of U.S. propaganda. To be honest, um, yeah, U. S. The U.S. defines human rights in a way which is extremely self serving and extremely narrow. Um, so, for example, I mean, going back to this issue about population control and China's one child policy and whatever. You know, I mean, I've read a lot of articles on this just in preparation because a lot of the charge around the, you know, Uyghur genocide narrative says, oh, well, now we know it's a, it's a genocide because we had now have evidence that they're intentionally suppressing population, which is, again, I'm just going to say this is outright ludicrous because the, the Uyghur population has been growing extremely rapidly for decades. Um, what we see is a slowing of the growth. And again, this is not consistent with a genocide in the slightest. You don't, you don't see populations continue to grow, just grow slower in the midst right. of a genocide. That is, that's not how it works, right? So, you know, what, what, people look at China and say, oh my God, what a, what a human rights violation. They are, they're finding women who, you know, just want to have more kids. You know, would I say like, oh, that's yes, that's a human rights violation? I would say no. I mean, you know, they they adopted fairly strict population controls. Uh, you know, did that did that uh, sway people's decision around families? I'm sure it did. Um, are economic factors a taken into account when people think about when and how many children to have in the United States? Of course they are. I mean, you'd be a fool if you said no. Are you are you kidding me? I mean, we live in a material world, right? It, right, right. It takes money to have and raise children. I mean, that's that's the reality of you know capitalism in the United States, right? So, right. Am I? But do we do we apply the narrative to human rights to that? Do we say, oh my God, look? You know, there are, um, <clears throat> you know, there's 20% of American households that earn $12,000 a year or less, right? Right. 20%. Do we look at 20% of American households, but tens of millions of households, right? Do yeah. we look at them and say, oh my God, there's a massive human rights violation that's affecting tens of millions of people in the United States because, th you know, that level of income is so low that how on earth can you have a decent life, right? What a human rights violation. Do we say that? No, of course no. not, right? I mean, right, we right. say, no, it's the greatest country on earth, freedom, equality, right. democracy, right? Right. But I mean, what does human rights mean, right? It, it means you can vote every four years? I, or I mean, does it does it mean that that the government is is actually trying very hard to eradicate poverty, right? 
I mean, that's China, right? I, they, they, they do their damnedest to raise the standard of living of the very poorest, and they, with a lot of success. Um, so I just, the, the, the propaganda narrative that is going on right now in the West is like throw everything against the wall and see what sticks, right? So we'll throw out genocide, sure. Oh, yeah, boom, 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 genocide, genocide, genocide. And then, and then we'll settle for human rights violation, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> And I'm like, uh, no, that's not that's not what this is. You know that that would be like if you if if you went to court and you said you're you're accused of murder, but we can't make the murder charge stick, so we're just going to give you ten years. You'd be like, I'm innocent, man. I didn't do it. You know, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, don't yeah. get ten years right. as a compromise. You know, I mean, right. but that's kind of like what U.S. prosecutors do. You know, they load up on charges, hoping that they can make one of them stick. You know, and then because the incentives are to you know to convict, right? So. We do the same with China, and I'm not going to say that there's human rights violations in a climate like this, not at all. Um, right. I'm going to, just as a discursive measure, right, because, you know, we're in, a, we're in a time where there's a lot of hardening of lines going on here, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an attempt to create a co new Cold War. I don't think that's a good time for people of conscience to be like, I'm neutral. You know, yeah, and yeah. I'm going to criticize both sides. I mean, right. you know, China is not the one trying to go to the war with the United States. You know, it's yeah. you know, the United States is playing the role of the aggressor here is is even now doing flyovers and, you know, ships close to the, inter, you know, the line of what is I mean, there's bases all around. So um, I don't see the two sides as equivalent and whatever morally or in any way. Um, so that I should, you know, step back and be like, well, I don't like this and I don't like that, whatever. I'm, I'm not, gonna, right. I'm not doing that. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, there is certainly a, um, there is a geopolitical sort of meta narrative about this stuff that like, you know, China is definitely the only power that is, uh, a, a real and genuine threat towards United States supremacy in, in terms of geopolitics, right? They have this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, which is set to have completion in like 2049 um, that will interconnect many different uh, regions in Asia. Uh, and, and so there are there are real signs that the United supremacy or the United States supremacy is is really, I mean, it's been on the decline for a while. Um, you know, we could talk all about, you know, how the empire is collapsing and what have you, but there is, you know, the, in the South Asian Pacific, there are all sorts of bases, like you've mentioned. You know, and 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 we're supposed to believe that that we are not the aggressors, or that China is like we're mad at them for dominating their own sea that's to the south of them. You know, <laughs> like, like of course, like yeah, you should be able to sail in the South China Sea. We sail the Gulf of Mexico. Like that's yeah. It would be like them getting mad at us for like having a uh, you know some ships off of a. Port in Alabama or something. Um, <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah. So, so there is this like geopolitical meta narrative that um, that we're sort of stoking the flames of division about because, uh, and it is a new Cold War kind of thing. And of course, the, the United States, even though they the the rhetoric would suggest that we want to go to war with them, you know, giant powers don't fight wars directly; they fight proxy wars. You know, so there especially are especially nuclear powers. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. exactly. So, you know, there there might be economic things going back and forth. There may be proxy wars, but there's certainly not going to be a, a great confrontation uh, between the two of them. But I, I guess I want to get into, you know, uh, I want you to tell me about Adrian Zenz, um, because the more I read about this guy, the more I, uh, you know, the more this sort of. Uh, you know, I, I talked a little bit about how I was a bit uncomfortable tackling this because I didn't want to be accused of like denial of genocide or what have you. But the more that I took a look at Adrian Zenz, the more it occurred to me that this is just uh, something that needs to be confronted and aired out. And, um, you know, when this was first happening, I remember seeing a few articles They were all written by Adrian Zenz, um, which was something that was very suspect to me because I, I if you're going to have uh, reports of human rights violations and a genocide. You would think there would be a variety of reporters reporting on this, um, but they all seem to have come specifically from Adrian Zenz. Right. And Adrian Zenz, uh, his sources are 
the World Uyghur Congress, which is basically ETIM, but renamed. Uh, they get massive funding from the State Department. They had a conference recently, and it featured uh, Nancy Pelosi, Marco Rubio, uh, the head of the, the uh, National Endowment for Democracy. I mean, they had some very high-powered Washington players there. Uh, they have complete bipartisan agreement, which should always make you a little bit suspicious, right? Right. Um, so it's like, okay, this is where Zenz goes to get to, to source his allegations. Where else does he go? Well, he goes to Radio Free Asia, which is, you know, again, this is an intelligence front. You know, this is, uh, right, I mean, their their whole aim is to make China look bad in whatever way that they can. And so, you know, these are, like, I call this the credibility problem, right? You have groups and, and individuals which are very interested in a particular narrative, and all they do is interpret government documents, witness reports in light of a pre-existing narrative. I mean, this is the opposite of good scholarship. This is, this is extremely prejudiced. And Zenz himself, um, you know, has a very weak background as a scholar, uh, is not a, never been employed by any university. Now, I don't want to say this as some kind of gatekeeping thing, because sure. I don't uh, really, I don't like that, that we have a very elitist uh, university system, you know, in the United States and in the mm -hmm. world. I think basically anybody who can make an argument, you should be evaluating the argument on its merits, not on the credentials of the person, right? Um, I mean, because anybody can attack somebody's credentials, right? I mean, somebody sure. can look at my credentials and say like, oh, oh Dr. Bear, what the hell, who the hell is this person, right? Oh, he teaches at a community college, uh, it's unknown, you know, unimportant person. And I mean, sure, all that's true, right? But it's like, you, you want to look at the case, right? Anybody can make a case. Let's evaluate that, right? I mean, right. maybe as a secondary level, we'd be interested in the person's credentials. I mean, you know, if, if they don't have much of a background in it, okay, that's interesting, right? I mean, I'm trying to be very forthright about this. I don't have a degree in China studies or something like that, right? I have a degree in economics. Um, you know, I don't, I don't speak the language here. Uh, I'm a relative newcomer to this field. Um, but I will tell you that I don't receive funding from the Victims of Communism uh, Fund, right? Ooh, I mean, that's yeah, that's where Zen's is employed, and this is, you know, you don't work at a group like that without a pre-existing view, um, and you don't get published by the Jamestown Foundation, for example, as another neoconservative organization, without advancing a certain narrative. Um, yeah. So you know that is problematic. And yes, all of these, all of these, there's a lot of clustering of sources. Um, but I also want to speak about the witness testimony. Um, there is this thing called the Xinjiang Victims Database. Um, this is what you see in the press, and it has enormous emotional impact, and we should recognize that, right? Which is people telling their stories, they sound absolutely horrible, right? And it's like, you know, our hearts are not made of stone, you know? I mean, like, you know, especially on the left, like, I mean, we're very sensitive to human suffering. I mean, that's, I think, why we, you know, criticize the brutality of capitalism. And so here we have people who are sharing their story of awful suffering. And then what are we, we're going to say, oh, you know, I don't believe this person or whatever. I mean, that seems so heartless, right? And, yeah. and there's a lot of these testimonies. We see them in tremendous variety and whatever. And a lot of people are convinced by it. And I mean, you know, I could point to like, okay, yes, a lot of these stories have been changed. Uh, a lot of them are just inaccurate, right? I mean, like people have said, oh, my my father's body was stolen and all this stuff and whatever. You know, I mean, the the, the so a, a Chinese reporter goes and interviews the mother and says, like, is this true? And no, he, here's his grave. We're at it right now, right? <laughs> it's, no, wow. Nobody's looted it, you know? Yeah, I mean, why? Why on earth is my is you know he's saying this, right? Uh, so we what we know is there's a lot of inaccuracies, and the inaccuracies are never reported on by the Western press. Um, and we know that there are political uh, factors at play here, right? I mean, are are some of these witnesses paid? Perhaps. I mean, I don't want to make that charge as a blanket statement, but. You know, are, are do some have uh, sympathies with separatist groups, and you know they're looking for this kind of testimony. Um, 
I'm sure that's part of it, right? I, what I what I say is in general, witness testimonies are just not very reliable when it comes to something which is supposed to be occurring over a whole region, right? Because one person is not going to be able to witness. There is no one person who's seen a million Uyghurs locked up, for example, right? Right. right. Um, one person's account is, you know, it, it's a piece of evidence, sure, but it's not the only piece you should look at. And then when it conflicts with what we see on the macro level, well, that should raise some questions. I mean, for an intelligent observer, right? And that's right. kind of what we look to the press for, right? Like, hey, you know, don't just report this with no questions asked. Like, you know, let's right. let's hear some opposition. Let's hear from the other side. Right. Let's look at the data, right? I mean, yeah. It, that's all what that's what goes into good reporting right and we're not seeing that at all we're seeing people saying oh my god there's a million Uyghurs locked up where is the outrage like this like right right well should we not establish whether it's true or not first before we immediately pivot to the outrage part yeah i mean there's all sorts of washington post stuff about this i mean i saw that uh even chris hayes had shared something uh about this stuff um you know the 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 what I keep coming back to the anti-communist part about it, um, and I keep coming back to when you mentioned the the bipartisan agreement, like nothing seems to get Dems and Republicans together like like a, a, like a shared common contempt for China, you know, and, and, and so that's that's unifying within itself. Yeah. Uh, and then, or and hate then, of Venezuela, that'll work too. Oh, right, right. It basically, like <laughs> anti-socialism, you know, anti-communism, yeah. anti-communism <laughs> comes together, and and yeah. So, so there's that aspect, but I, but I also, uh, you know, I, I think that the anti-communist part of this equation is is understated. Um, and just as an example, there was a woman. Uh, she's the daughter of the late Senator Monahan. I think is I I don't remember her first name, but I but I came across this because uh and 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 this was a viral story lately how she was yelling uh go back to communist China at a couple of Asian folks uh, on the streets of New York City. Ah. Um so I haven't I, I seen that one. Okay. Well well the only I, I became aware of it because she was wearing a mask that she obtained from my favorite local bar in Woodstock. And the owner of that bar was like, holy shit, like, this is terrible <laughs> publicity. What is, you know, um, so I went to the viral. It went the viral. Wrong. Yeah, man. And it's right there on her face. <laughs> and they're trying to ID this woman. And, and oh, he, yeah. he's pretty well known. She's the daughter of a senator and stuff. But um, so I want to emphasize how anti-communism is like it, it understated. Um, and But it plays a huge role in this um, because I. You know, this woman deleted her Twitter immediately after this, and I went to her website to take a look at some stuff. And and this woman defies all of the uh, liberal notions of what should cure racism, like uh, being worldly, traveled, educated. You know, I mean, she went to Harvard. She is an artist. She grew up in 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 India. She speaks like four to five different languages. But then four or five years ago, she started reporting on the human rights abuses of the Chinese Communist Party. And so now we see this woman defying these notions of the worldliness and education, uh, curing whatever Western prejudices one may may harbor. Um, uh, you know, it, it's you can still be a, a giant bigot and, and, and a racist. Despite you know Ivy League education, despite um, d d despite speaking different languages and having a picture of you with the Dalai Lama on your website, you know um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> despite whatever artistic endeavors you have, um, so. But I think it was the anti-communism that did her in, and and so I, I think that's what uh, you know it, it what caused all this anti-Asian sentiment in her case to raise the surface. Um, but you see this this the backing of this narrative by by media sources in the United States, and you see the sort of bipartisan agreement that happens within our elected officials. and 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 I think the anti-communist part of it plays a larger role than I think we're we're really given it uh, than than we acknowledge. Um, could you perhaps speak to some of the anti-communism that is uh, that is a part of these narratives, whether it's the 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 coronavirus uh, narrative, whether it's the the, the Uyghur genocide, I mean, 
as a person who studies Marxism, uh, you know, I'm sure that you have noticed this and it doesn't go under underplayed on your end. Well, it's very it's very strange with China because there's a kind of split narrative about China. Um, We are told on the one hand that China is a Marxist Leninist regime, uh, that China is communist, that China is socialist. It's a little surprising, actually, to see Secretary of State Mike Pompeo use the phrase Marxist-Leninist. Like, you, you're like <laughs> I didn't even know these people knew this phrase. I mean, you I had know, no idea. Yeah. usually they use socialists and communism interchangeably, which, you know, has problems for, for anybody who knows the Marxist literature. Um, you know, communism refers to a, a stateless society that, you know, where they, you've triumphed over exploitation. Uh, No one is taking the surplus that somebody else has produced. Uh, There's no commodities. There's no money. I mean, that's an aspiration uh, in China. You know, that's not the reality. I mean, nobody, no serious Marxist would would look at China and be like, oh, China's communist. You know, Uh, certainly no member of the CPC would say that. Uh, They say, yes, that's our dream. You know, that's what we're trying to move towards. Right. We what we have now is an intermediary stage, right? We have socialism with Chinese characteristics. You know, I mean, we've had to make compromises because, hey, we're a we're a bubble of socialism in an extremely hostile capitalist world, right? And yeah, you know, does that mean we have to make concessions? We don't get to completely write our ticket. Yeah, that's what it means, right? So, you know, that that and at the same time, we're also told that China is capitalist. And that and and that they have a very brutal form of capitalism and whatever. And it's it's crazy making because you're like, I don't know, you know, does anyone here take these terms seriously? You know, like, I mean, right. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, people who are into capitalism don't actually really understand what it is. You know, I mean, it's it's the critics of capitalism who have a much better idea of what it is than those who support it. Like, you know, capitalism exists when. The employer-employee relationship is the dominant relationship in the society. Uh, when we have the means of production are privately owned, uh, where we do not have planning, we have the anarchy of production. Right. Yeah. Um, the the economy develops or fails to do so just you know based on no national plan, just based on what happens. Right. The competition between uh, different industrial powers. Um, so, you know, wh- how would we characterize China in the midst of this? I mean, if it's capitalism, it's a different kind of capitalism than we've ever seen anywhere, right? So I personally don't like to use that term I- except with a major asterisk on it. Um, sure. I-, I would just use the term they use, right? I would say, yeah, it's a, it's a form of socialism. Is it the only form? No. Um, it is, you know, there's many forms of capitalism as well. Um, that's the position I like, but I, I'm not going to like die on that hill either. You know, if somebody likes right. a different terminology, oh, you, cap, you know, China is revisionist and they've fallen into capitalism or whatever. There's certainly people who, who make that argument. Um, you know, I, I, I'm more interested in what happens next than I am in, you know, how do we like, you know, yeah. the problem is we cannot, we, we don't have a uniform agreement on what is capitalism and what is socialism to begin with, right? These are contested terms. Um, so of course there's going to be arguments about it. I'm not sure if I'm totally answering the question here at this point, but, uh, you know, those are, those are things that I think of when I think about criticisms of, of China that come from the West, right? So we, we, it's like, we want to, we want capitalism to take the credit uh, for raising, you know, 850 million people out of poverty in China. And I'm like, okay, so capitalism gets the credit and socialism always gets the blame. Like that's just not legitimate, right? That's not a serious way of studying something, you know, that's right. right. That's like a theology or something. Not, not that's not, a, <laughs> that's not right. social science. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, it, we're very quick to criticize China for their, um, for their reproductive policies. Um, and I think there has been some conflation of broader national uh, population policies um, as they apply to the Uyghur population. Um, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's, I, I've read that there's like only loosely enforced population policies and there's a, a three child maximum for Uyghur populations as opposed to the more dominant Han population in the region. Yeah, which they did actually did not even enforce the three child policy all that rigorously. And so 
you know, this is why they had strong population growth. Um, you know, every, everyone who studies this stuff, even, even moderately, knows that as a, a region grows, as it develops, as it industrializes, you go through a demographic transition. Uh, you know, women have more opportunities, right? As education becomes widespread, right? Women uh, can choose if they want to, you know, be in the household and be engaged with, you know, childbearing and child rearing, or if they want to do other things, and some will do other things. I mean, that's that's just the reality of human life, right? And so what typically happens is the, the birth rate falls, the fertility rate falls. Um, and China had a remarkable story with this, you know, I mean, up until uh, the 1960s, China had a fertility rate of six. Um, that means on average, it, you know, every woman in China had six children. I mean, that's an wow. astounding figure, right? I mean, yeah. for every woman who's childless, there's a woman with 12 children, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. an astounding figure, right? That's a lot, yeah. <laughs> and through their policies, they they saw a rapid decline uh, in in the fertility rate, it went from six to two point seven five. Um, it was one of the most dramatic declines. Um, but you know, this this yeah, the the ethnic minorities were were left out of this enforcement, especially in rural areas. Um, you know that they just didn't enforce it for whatever reasons in in Xinjiang, and then they started to enforce it, and and then this is when I said, oh my God, it's genocide, right? Look at this, you know. So it's a very selective thing, though, because you could look at it and say, well, they give out free health care, which includes free birth control, which, in, which is, generally speaking, I mean, like, if you ask Western liberal women, is it a good idea to provide free women's health care, including free birth control? They would right. say, absolutely. Are you kidding yeah. me? Of course, right? Yeah. Like parenthood yeah. all the way. Right, right. I don't right. Yeah. It, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's like we like when that stuff happens in the West, but if China was to do it, right, then we say, right. oh, ooh, fascism, you know, I Nazis and whatever. And it's like they they are doing what socialist countries do, which is massively invest in healthcare. Uh, and, you know, these things are good for women. I mean, to say that there's some kind of you know, human rights abuse toward women in general or toward toward Uyghurs. I mean, so Zenz came up with this statistic. This is kind of like his headline statistic in his uh, 2020 paper that he wrote about forced sterilization and population control. This is the one where it's like, now we've nailed down the case for why there's a genocide. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't nail down the case at all, right? I mean, he's like, he said, well, okay, they started to... to enforce these policies and his headline figure is well they are they are forcibly implanting uh you know these ieds in in um in women and 80 percent of the new of the of the IED, ieds are, are in xinjiang and that's like a oh my god what a you know that's the smoking gun you know um but people looked at his figures and they were like that's not at all true right the figure is 8.7 percent um, where the hell did you get this 80%? And he he's very angrily fought back and said, well, these are net IUD placements, and that, that means placements minus removals. Um, and the thing is, you have just produced a garbage statistic by doing that, because net IUD placements is just simply not meaningful, you know? Like, IUDs do not stay in permanently, you know? They are designed to provide birth control for a certain period, and then they're going to be removed. So to say that a removal equals an insertion is um, garbage, right? I mean, that's right. that's nonsense. Like, you know, so I, I had a thread on this. Uh, this is, comes from a book that I'm working on on this topic. And I said, let's think about this, right? Like, imagine you have a thousand women in their early 20s, and let's say they get IUDs implanted because... You know, I mean, like anybody who's getting an education or whatever, or is trying to develop their career, you know, you don't want to have a family yet, right? You want to focus on that. Let's say you then get to removed in your early 30s. Uh, so this, if a thousand get them removed at that time, you have a net IUD rate of zero. But that's not meaningful, right? If you use that, it, lo it looks like, oh, there's no birth control. But right. that's not true, right? You have what what you have there is ten years of prime reproductive uh, 
period of a woman's life that have actually been controlled, right? To her benefit. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the point of family planning, right? Um, now, what Zens does is, first of all, come up with these just crazy statistics that nobody actually uses, but also give everything a very sinister interpretation, you know, like, right. oh, they're, they're forced to do this and whatever. And, you know, can you believe there's fines that economically penalize women and whatever? And it's like, like, you know, on earth, again, like the material reality is that you have to support children, right? Like, you yeah. know, to act like uh, that that doesn't exist in the West. It only exists in evil China. I mean, this is this is just, um, you know, you're already prejudicing the jury there. And Zenz himself, uh, I, I want to say that he taught at like an evangelical university. So he he's of the opinions around... Uh, you know, reproductive uh, birth control. Um, I, he comes from this very conservative strain that would, uh, you know, these are the same people in our society that are saying that Planned Parenthood are a bunch of baby killers and stuff, you know. So the, the sensation is language. Yes. Right. I haven't seen his views on birth control in the West. My guess is that if he was, uh, if he talked about that for a little while, he'd lose a lot of his liberal following. Um, right. I think people would go, oh, my God, that's who, you know, that's the champion of human rights. I mean, I think this is probably given given what he's said about the rapture. You know, he said the rapture is coming. We should do what we can to hasten it and oh Jews won't survive it. I mean, like, wow. that's the kind of the theological perspective that Zeds is coming from. He has tried to edit his past, you know, like he did write this book about the rapture. And it's getting harder to find because, you know, it's like now it's an embarrassment, you know. And so you have like the photoshopping of the cover so that his name is not included and whatever, because, you know, people people will look at this and say, like, uh, this is the background of the person who's making these charges. Again, I think it's a little bit weak of an argument, but, you know, it should go in the mix. Like all this stuff should go in the mix. You know, you don't you don't agree or disagree with somebody because of their credentials or their views on something else, right? I mean, a person could certainly be deeply religious. Uh, you know, Isaac Newton, uh, Rene Descartes. I mean, these were right. very religious people, right? Uh, and they can still say some good things. You know, <laughs> so we don't want to <laughs> like throw out the Cartesian system because of you know Descartes was very religious. Not at all, right? Right, right. Uh, I think we we want to just look at everything, and and this is what you're not seeing in the uh, the people who who make this charge. They are not looking at everything. They are looking at things incredibly selectively, incredibly uh, prejudiciously, uh, and and they're producing you know this this narrative that it just doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Right. I mean, there's also the thing that you call the motivation problem. Which is there's never really an explanation as to what on earth like China's interest could be in slaughtering Uyghurs or destroying their culture, um, right? And when it seems like a lot of this, uh, it can be explained away through China's interest in like national unity, um, social stability, territorial integrity. Um, could you maybe speak to a little bit of that? Sure. Um... Yeah, China is, you know, they they want to they want to create a a strong and unified nation. I mean, they're very open about that. Um they have they have tried to uh you know, create a a language that is widely spoken, right? This is uh, uh Patungwa or um you know, common common Chinese or standard Chinese. Um you know, it wasn't that long ago that only 53% of the country, um, you know, spoke this at a level which was considered passable, you know, 53%. So this is a very diverse country, right, and region. Right. Um, it has, I mean, like they recognize, there's a lot of languages that are spoken in China. Um, and, you know, people are committed to their language and their culture, as they should be, of course, right? Uh, so how do you have national unity when people can't communicate, when you don't have a shared basis for that? So, you know, China has tried to improve educational access, basically, right? Because they recognize, well, I mean, I think everybody recognizes that there's economic benefits to speaking the majority language. Should you give up your native language? No. 
But, you know, if you want to advance and you're going to have more opportunities, that's just the reality. Right. I mean, like the same would be true in the United States. Right. If you don't if you don't speak English in the United States, there's going to be doors that are closed to you. Right. And that's just a a reality of the majority uh, country, majority language country. Um, The main thing is, are the powers that be actively suppressing, you know, like. The, the language and culture of, of a minority in the United States is very clear that that was done with the Native Americans. It, I mean, it's crystal clear. Right. That is a linguistic genocide. Absolutely. Right. The explicit, intentional, written uh, attempt and largely successful to destroy these people. Right. Take their land destroy their language and culture, forcibly assimilate, right? Separate the children from the parents, put them in, you know, white run orphanages or white foster homes. I mean, that that's U.S. history right there, you know? Right. So it, it's interesting that we find that so easy to believe, uh, you know, in the, in, in the Uyghur context, um, even though it, it's pretty much the opposite of all of that stuff is true there. Um, China has recognized that the best way to achieve its its political aims is to raise people's standard of living, right, and to protect their culture. I mean, because I mean, how would you if you wanted to fuel a separatist movement in in uh, Xinjiang or Tibet or any place, right? What do you do? Well, you step on the rights of, of minorities, right? Right. You 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 ghettoize them. You make sure that they are cut off from the development that the rest of the country enjoys so they do the opposite of that essentially right and you know they they don't want to see parts of their territory sheared away uh, they want to but at the same time they recognize every country has a massive issue with rural versus urban development right urban areas are richer you know i mean and that produces rural to urban migration um and it produces uneven development, right? It means that there's fewer opportunities in the countryside than there are in the cities. That's the reality of industrialization for the last 300 years, right. maybe even longer. Um, and so China is like aware of that as well, right? They want to, you know, enhance rural development, but they're trying to enhance every kind of development, right? So they permit a certain unevenness between the cities and the rural areas because it's largely unavoidable, right? Um, but, and, and you know, that means like, okay, if there's a lot of Uyghurs living in, say, south of, in, in south of part of Xinjiang, this is a more rural part of the region, right? And so, you know, it's like we need focused economic development in that region in order to accomplish those goals of poverty reduction, rising income, et cetera. And that's how China sees like their, um, you know, their mission or their, their best path to territorial integrity and security is through that rising prosperity, not through, you know, oppression and elimination. You just don't see that uh, in any of the, the documents. And this is why Zens and others, they say, look, the documents prove it. And then they give you this like few word snippet out of a government document, right? And right. it's like, this is not, you know, you've taken it completely out of its out of its context and inverted the meaning, you know. Right. Um, so, like, you know, Zen's has this quote that says, like, you know, the the uh, it's about the Chinese, the China needing to create a nation race, and you're like, oh well, sounds pretty racist, right? A nation race, oh my god, right? That right, sounds like right. Nazi shit right there, right? But. That is a very particular interpretation of a Chinese concept, which has nothing to do with racial purity. I mean, this is not a white supremacist ethno state type of attempt. Right. Pure projection. It, what it means now. is yeah. the spirit of national unity, right? It doesn't mean nation, race. I mean, that's that's just a very, very questionable translation and interpretation of this document. And again, that's supposed to function as a kind of smoking gun. When it's very far from that, uh, and but you know these are difficult charges to 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 deal with. You know, like it's like there's certain charges which we just react with such outrage, and you know the the accused is just supposed to be just you know 
like have some humility, man. You know, like you say, how dare you fight it? You what are you a genocide denialist or you know? Yeah, like, yeah. You've been accused of awful abuses. Just accept it and you know say you're sorry, right? Like yeah. you know, yeah. you, you're saying you didn't do it as uh, you know not good. Stop that. You know, like yeah, man. So it's like what you know, it sticks to you no matter what, and it, that seems to be kind of like the, you know, this is an extremely manipulative kind of campaign. You know that like takes our you know, concern in our conscience and uses it, weaponizes it to make us favor war, you know, <laughs> like, and who's going to suffer in, in a, in a, in a war, a cold war, or let's say uh, probably the end game here is just to be able to kind of isolate China, place sanctions on China. So the first step would be get a bunch of countries to agree that there's genocide. And that's the, the stage that we're in now, right? Right. A couple of countries, you know, U.S. client states or allies or whatever, have said, okay, yes, right, it's genocide. Um, and, you know, hope they're trying to get, okay, get a broad thing and get this through the U.N. and then impose sanctions. Who are those sanctions likely to hurt the most, right? Sanctions fall very heavily on the poor, you right. know? Right. And like, so we're supposed to support this yeah, because of our conscience and our good feelings toward the Uyghurs, right? Right, um, right. Oh, but I also think that like this, this goes back to the Belt and Road Initiative as we were speaking to and that like if we can convince enough of our Western partners to uh, universally declare that there is a genocide going on, then we can impose sanctions that can isolate this country and perhaps take away from the uh, their ability to coordinate a multi-territorial, multi-nation, multi-ethnic uh, Belt and Road infrastructure project, um, right? Which in in itself would kind of just be the the straw on the camel's brat uh, on this camel's back that would say, hey, you know, clearly the United States is not the superior power in in geopolitics at this point. I mean, if if China was to secure a multi-territory uh, uh, you know, Belt and Road Initiative that would connect all of these different places in Asia. I mean, clearly that would uh, set them far and apart from the stance of the United States. Um, so you you hit a very good point in that, in that like it, these these folks are leveraging basic parts of our humanity that cause uh, us to respond emotionally, that that tug at heartstrings, that uh, that that beckon for a call of like just human decency in a way that is weaponized in order to forward this sort of um, agenda of further isolation of China or um, perhaps disrupting their, their, their belt and road initiative by way of sanctions or charges of genocide. And, and I think that in the evaluation of all of this information um, it's, it's worth noting who has a vested interest in this exaggeration um, being taken literally, like the Victims of Communist Foundation, which is clearly like a bad faith right wing think tank. Yeah, so I I think there's enough here to piece together a sort of geopolitical worldview that that can very clearly speak to the incentives and motivations. Of, of folks that would want to forward this sort of narrative. Yeah. I want to say something too about like, you know, you, you just on in line with the, the geopolitics uh, to try to prevent China from being more of a regional power that it, than it, it already is. Cause that's clearly the direction, right? I mean, right. they are creating all kinds of trade agreements. I mean, they're, they're building infrastructure in Africa, right? I mean, Right. All of the, you know, the hundreds of years of Western colonialism of Africa never produced much usable infrastructure in Africa, right? And so all of a sudden, China is building infrastructure, right, for the benefit of these countries. Now, does it also benefit China? Of course, right? I mean, China is self-interested in that sense, right? They're not doing this as a charity effort. They're doing it as, you know, a growth initiative, right? Right. But they're trying to do it in a fair way as well, right? They're not they're not trying to do, in, in my perception, they're not trying to do neo-colonialism, right? They, right. they are trying to, you know... Um, there's, there's no such thing as Chinese imperialism. <laughs> yeah, that's my basic, <laughs> my basic take on it, too. I, I think that what... So the United States, I think, would like to slow this. I don't think that they think that they can stop it necessarily. Uh, they know that they don't have a lot of pull uh, with countries in Africa, just, uh, apart from a few client states, um, 
they want to slow it down, you know, and they also want to prevent China from climbing the ladder of manufacturing. You know, China has been very smart about this, right? They they did all of these market reforms under Deng in the late 70s, opened up the economy, right, allowed for private capital to flourish to some extent in China while retaining a lot of the key state-run sectors. Um, but there was always a plan, right? It was always like, yeah, we need foreign exchange so that we don't get trapped in a kind of basic commodity production model. You know, that was that was fine for the Maoist period, right? We needed to just develop our kind of basic level industries. But if we don't develop into more advanced manufacturing, we're always going to be poor, right? I mean, right. that's that's the problem. And a lot of countries get get stopped here. They do a certain level of industrialization. It's like you could think of it as being like um, the textile industry, right? The textile industry is where the Industrial Revolution started in Britain. These days, though, and, you know, it is industrialization, but these days it's pretty low-level industrialization, right? Like cloth, clothing, thread, stuff like this. It's pretty low-value added, you know? I mean, you have to start producing more, uh, you know, intensive, more value-added manufactured goods, right? Um, so, you know, you start producing tools, you start producing machines, you start producing cars, right? I mean, now you're moving up the value ladder, and then you move into where China is, robotics, uh, electronics, right? And now you start cutting into the market of the advanced capitalist powers, right? Like the United States does not give a fuck if its clothing comes from China, right? Because right. that's our textile industry has been gutted a long time ago. You know, it's was out. So we don't we don't produce any clothing in the United States, right? Uh, we used to, we used to, I mean, back when we were climbing the ladder ourselves, we used to have a very developed textile industry. Uh, it's just that we made the shift towards greater value added, right? right? And China is doing that much more quickly than anybody thought they would. And partly that's because they have planning and because they have a very smart uh, and competent group of leadership that, you know, understands this, right? This is the irony of people saying that socialists don't understand economics, right? Uh, they have a lot of very smart economists. Working yes, they do. In the, in the, yes, they do. <laughs> the CBC. Uh, and they understand, you know, like they studied the history of industrialization and they, they, they have an understanding of how the advanced nations, even very small nations, you know, places that don't control any territory, let's say places like uh, Austria, or or germany or switzerland right like how are these countries rich you know they don't have any empires well right. they they produce very high value added stuff right mm -hmm. and there's a there's a market for that and so you know that's that's the story of switzerland right and so you know we see this now because we see the united states being like oh we're going to ban tiktok or you know we're going to we're, 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 oh, China is harvesting your data or whatever. I mean, like, meanwhile, again, we're ones to talk about that, right? Um, you know, does Google harvest your data? Like, come on, that's their entire right. business model, right? Right, right. Um, so I think that that's the kind of, it's like a containment project. I don't think anybody's talking about invading China. I've, I've read articles about this where they basically say, very difficult. You know, you can't really... Yeah have a hot war with a nuclear power and you can't really invade China. Um, they just won't stand for it. Right. And, uh, yeah. you know, but you can try to fuck with them. You can try to right, camp, right, you know, right, contain right. them, try to prevent them from, from, you know, being able to ink these trade agreements, uh, or, or, you know, at least prevent them from penetrating the European market. Um, yeah, it's like a torturous interference kind of thing going on. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I mean, I, the whole TikTok thing, I completely forgot about that. But you're right in that 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 does play a part into uh, a bit of like, I guess it forwards the notions of of distrust of Eastern nations. It forwards the notion of a bit of anti-communism paranoia in there and that they they think that they're going to track our information, which what do you think your iPhone is doing? Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the whole thing about Huawei cell phones, you know, it, whenever China starts cutting into Western dominated markets, there is some pushback. So they want to isolate 
you know, things like Alibaba or things like Huawei or, or TikTok, um, as well as China as a nation as a whole. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because I, I had honestly forgot all about the TikTok and Huawei things. But these little bits and pieces, when you start piecing them together, you start looking at the Adrian Zen stuff, you start looking at maybe some of the statistics of Uyghur birth rates. Um, I think you're absolutely right that all of this has a lot of narrative inconsistencies. Um, and uh, and I would encourage listeners to to go and look this stuff up, uh, you know, themselves. I mean, I'll, I'll obviously leave a link to some of these threads that you've that you've had. Um, you said you're working on a book about this. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, the the threads that I've been writing on Twitter have been, you know, kind of like excerpts from from this project. Uh, you know, I just wanted to to learn more about this, study this, look at um, look at more of the data, or and just look at the way that the narrative itself has changed over time. Because you know, you go from uh, the West kind of embracing uh, China's uh, you know um, policies in Xinjiang, or seeing China as a kind of partner in, against Islamic uh, uh, separatism or Islamic radicalization, and to then an almost immediate 180 degree turn where uh, where China is, is being vilified as an enemy. And so this is kind of what motivated me. And also just, you know, having these conversations with people, you know, seeing uh, how are people reacting to this this campaign and how is it being framed right how is it how is it using our sensibilities and i think a lot of it is actually targeted specifically toward the left you know because the left is you know as a group very compassionate you know very concerned yeah. with like what is going on in the world right and you know this this kind of uh, atrocity porn or you know this genocide narrative is is really like that's something that I think those of us who are on the left kind of find it easy to believe, right? This, some great power is oppressing somebody. I mean, come on, like that's a lot of history right there, right? Like that's, right, right. that's a very believable kind of narrative. And I think there's something that's just incredibly cynical about taking this, adopting the language of the left in order to advance war and especially advance the interests of the American empire. I mean, and that made me like when I realized that was happening, I was like, that's just infuriating. You know? Oh yeah. It's just absolutely infuriating. And I was like, I can't believe there isn't there aren't books being written about this, you know? And like, I don't know that I'm the best positioned person to write about this. Like I said, I'm not sure. I, you know, I'm not an expert in this for a long time. I'm I studied other things, right? So I'm I'm having to kind of learn as I go along. Um, and it's been great because I've talked to a lot of people, I've you know, in, in, in gathering this and then especially putting it out there on Twitter and just kind of seeing what are the responses, you know, what are, what are other people saying about this? Um, I mean, I'm trying to learn as much as I can here. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think that I know, uh, the truth about it. I don't think anybody really knows the truth about any complex situation here. Um, I think we're all, we're all learning, but it's like the more I understand the context, uh, the less believable the narrative becomes. Um, so I don't think there's going to be some kind of gotcha at the end of this. I mean, you know, right, it'd right. be interesting if there was, but right, you know, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm in the process of like, uh, I may be uh, halfway done with a book or something like this. So I'm, I'm looking for looking at publishers and whatever. Um, but it's been, I mean, I've never, I've never written in this style before where I'm like sharing parts of it publicly, you know, and then seeing right. like, it's interesting because there's a certain uh, value in it. Like I get, you know, just seeing, well, what, what kind of response is there? You know, are people interested in this? Uh, I mean, people are suggesting things and, you know, other people have analyzed it, which is really helpful. Um, I don't think anyone does really good work alone, you know, you kind of sure. you have to learn from each other. Well, I, is it a, I, I guess if you're sharing parts of it publicly, it seems like it's a, 
like a very conversative form of writing that you're happening, you know, yeah, right. uh, which is really cool because I, I think that, um, that, that it's a conversive sort of development of this book is really cool. Um, it, it kind of, what comes to mind is like, uh, because this is such a fresh event and it's such a fresh narrative. Um, it, it's like, kind of like, uh, Zizek when he came out with that COVID-19 book, like 15 minutes after the pandemic started, um, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, uh, and, and that book kind of reads like, it's just, I wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was like, a like a recorded dialogue that he just answered a few questions and talked for a couple hours or something, you know, and that's <laughs> right. kind of how that book reads. Um, but I, I'm excited to, to, to read that whenever you're, um, done with it, because I, you know, just the threads that I picked up uh, uh, from following you on Twitter, um, you know, I'd really served to inform uh, some of the some of the hunches I had that I hadn't really articulated or or, or known where to look in order to sort of uh, decipher what these inconsistencies are, um, where we can point to for evidence, and and where it was appropriate to interrogate the credentials of individuals involved. Uh, instead of like an ad hominem thing, but really bringing out motivations and agendas that may not be surface level to, uh, to, right. to some readers. This is a very difficult to study area because there is so much detail. I mean, they're just even trying to get clear on like these charges and whatever. I mean, a new document just came out about this and it's like this 60 page document, right? Like, I mean, even people who are like, you know, like have a lot of training in this area. This is like hard to, to just even take in, you know, let alone right. evaluate. And so I feel like we're kind of in the midst of like a kind of gish gallop of, you know, just like, you know, like fire hose you. And then you end up thinking, well, gosh, you know, this, not all this is true, but, but some of it might be, you know, and then right. it's like, okay, well, so we, we won't call it a genocide, but we'll call it something bad, you know? And, and then, yeah. you know, I mean, these people are like mission accomplished, you know, like they, right, they, right. Yeah. <laughs> and again, there, there are clear incentives. There are clear, um, uh, there are clear motivations on, on the side of the United States for why they would want to frame this and posit this, however, in bad faith or what have you, it, it clearly advances the goals of the U S empire. And it clearly is meant to, um, discredit China in, in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, so do you have anything else to leave with our listeners before we uh, wrap up our conversation, Dr. Bear? I do have a, a YouTube channel. If people are interested in learning more about uh, socialism and communism, I have put my lectures up. I, I lecture on these topics. Uh, I've got stuff about the history of China. I don't have a video about uh, the Uyghur situation yet. I'll probably produce one. Um, but I do have, a, a, you know, readings of some of the kind of classic texts in Marxism, Communist Manifesto, uh, Mao's right. on Contradiction. Uh, so I encourage people to check that out. That's, uh, that's youtube.com slash Asatar Bear. Um, and I also teach meditation on there. It's another thing that I do if people are interested in that. So yeah, um, something to check out. And, and hopefully I'll have the book done soon because I, I you know, this, so it, it does feel like a pressing issue that's developing rapidly. Yeah, it feels like there's a real urgency to this, um, especially with the the stuff that just happened in Atlanta. Um, but I think this has been coming down the road for a while um, with the uh, with the TikTok, with the Huawei stuff, with the uh, with the the coronavirus rhetoric, with uh, with all of this stuff. It just seemed like there was no possible way for any of this to end without ending in violence, you know. Um, yeah. So this has been. You know, it, it's been like a slow motion train wreck in a way. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I, I'm really I'm just really happy to talk to you, man. And I I hope that you'll be a friend of the show and come back, because uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I think before we started recording, um, I originally wanted to, to speak to you about socialism and, and Marxism. And because uh, I really enjoy your very plainly worded common sense approaches to this stuff that explain it in such a way that like more accessible than I've found with, with most writers. And so I, I do really appreciate your post in, in that regard. Thank so. you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I'd be happy to come back if you want to talk about, uh, about socialism or Marxism or whatever at some point in the future. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, have a great day. Thank you for your time again. I, I so appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely.